Great. Um, so switching gear, I'm going to talk about diagnosis and imaging of TOS and upper extremity disease, but I've crossed out the extremity, upper extremity disease because I think Dr. Bavar is going to talk about it. So disclosures, none. Um, one brief slide on the history of TOS. It was first clinically recognized by Dr. Cooper in 1821. It's an old disease, and uh, Pete introduced the term TOS in 1956. Thoracic outlet syndrome is managed by a number of different people. Actually, neurosurgeons do it, uh, thoracic surgeons do it, we do it, um, and some of the general surgeons do it. So there's actually quite a bit of overlap. I personally don't actually do much of these. I've done a couple of cases with venous TOS. Um, so you'll, you'll um, see that, that I don't have a lot of personal experience when I present these slides. But I think I finally understood TOS after reading this one article that I'm going to show you. To me, it's kind of a complicated thing, but it can actually be simplified. And um, the definition of TOS is when you have symptomatic compression of the neurovascular bundle at the thoracic outlet, right? So you need to know what the thoracic outlet is. So the anatomy is really important. And after reading this article a few years ago, I finally understood what TOS is after all these years. Um, and so anatomy is all about relationships. So you need to know the relationships between one structure and the other structure. So bony boundaries is important with regard to the muscular ligamentous attachments and how the relationships between those structures and the neurovascular bundle um, looks like that sort of how you can develop um, thoracic outlet syndrome. So this is looking from the top down. You can see the thoracic outlet is really uh, formed posteriorly by the bone, the vertebra, and then laterally by the thoracic, um, by the first rib laterally, and then anteriorly by the sternum. And this is a look from kind of above again, but it sort of shows you the anatomy. So this is um, just briefly reviewing the um, the nerve of the uh, arm, and you can see the nerve roots come out, and the nerve roots come together to form the trunks, right? You talk about upper, middle, and lower trunks. And then the trunks come together to form um, the, the uh, divisions, and then the divisions then split again and then come together to form the cords. And the cords are the ones that really come together to form the brachial plexus that then crosses over the uh, first rib to go to the arm. Now you see the vein and the artery in this relationship. Vein is anterior and artery is, is a posterior to the vein. And in this other sort of anatomy slide, you can sort of see here the important structures when we, for the management of TOS. You can see the clavicle is kind of lies on, on top. You have the um, things that you must remember is the anterior scalene divides or splits the uh, subclavian vein in front of it and the subclavian artery behind it. And then you have the middle scalene, which is behind the nerve, the nerve bundle and behind the artery. This is the first rib, and this is the subclavius muscle just below the clavicle, and the costal clavicular ligament is the other important structure. So if you remember this slide, it's sort of the only slide I think you really would need to remember in terms of management. So when you talk about venous thoracic outlet syndrome, it's typically because of uh, one of three things. It's either um, because of the costoclavicular ligament being too lateral, it pinches on the subclavian vein, or hypertrophy of the scaling, um, anterior scaling muscle that pushes the vein as well, or the subclavius muscle sometimes can be hypertrophy, or if you have a first rib coming down that kind of pulls, uh, I'm sorry, if you have a cervical rib that comes down and pulls the first rib um, sort of higher, and it can cause constriction of the subclavian vein. Now, posterior to the anterior scaling is where the artery and the nerve bundles are, and um, this is where you get the arterial uh, compression or the nerve compression. And it could be either muscles being hypertrophy, the anterior scaling, or the middle scaling, or a cervical rib coming down. So um, this is the lateral view. This is the view that you would see if you do transaxillary approach to uh, removing the first rib. Um, and again, um, just sort of look at the relationship between the clavicle, the first rib, and the anterior scaling muscle. The vein is anterior to it. The artery is posterior to it. The brachial plexus is lateral to the artery and a little bit higher as it comes down. Um, above the first rib, and um, this is um, a good view, I think, to remember, okay, the relationship between these structures.
So um, again, this is just a view of the nerve uh, plexus. Let's review the anatomy of the subclavian artery just quickly. Um, so the subclavian artery, there's three parts to it, right? And same thing for the axillary artery, there are three parts to it. And so what divides the three parts of the subclavian artery? It's um, the anterior scaling muscle right here. So the part in front of the um, scaling muscle is the uh, first part of the subclavian, the part behind it, the second part, and the part um, lateral to the anterior scaling muscle is the third part of the subclavian artery. And this is the uh, axillary artery, so where does it begin? It begins um, as the artery crosses the first lateral board of the first rib, which is here. Okay, so this is the, axillary, uh, the subclavian artery, and as the subclavian artery crosses the lateral border of the first rib, it becomes the axillary artery. There are three parts of the axillary artery, the one that's above the coracoid uh, I'm sorry, the pectoralis minor muscle is the first segment of the axillary. The second segment of the axillary is behind the pec minor. And then the um, third part of the axillary artery kind of comes down. I always have it difficult to remember what's, the, what, what's uh, the landmark between where the axillary artery becomes the breaker artery. And it is the lateral border of the teres major muscle, right? So this is where it becomes the breaker artery. So the vein kind of has the same um, sort of a nomenclature. Um, essentially, we go in the opposite direction, right? But um, you can sort of, the, the name of the vein takes the same uh, path as the artery as it crosses these different muscles. So the first cause of thoracic outlet syndrome, I think that is very treatable, um, is shown here in, in that there's a cervical rib the incidence of cervical rib overall is relatively um, rare, but you can see how the cervical rib can attach to or fuse to the first rib, and this will pull the um, thoracic outlet up and narrow that space. Um, and so cervical rib is, I think, one of the things if you find and the patient has symptoms related to it, then you know that you likely will be able to help the patients quite a bit. Um, here, this is another... Um, view of a lateral view of the thoracic outlet. And you, here you sort of, what's demonstrated is the, um, what people talk about is the cone of the, the nerve cone that's formed between the middle scalene muscle and the anterior scalene muscle. And you see here um, the subclavian artery is uh, behind the anterior scalene muscle. Nicely there. Here is another view showing where the uh, subclavian vein can be pinched um, at where the space between the anterior scalene muscle is and the uh, costal clavicular ligament is narrow. You can pinch the subclavian vein um, just as it crosses over the first rib um, and underneath the clavicle. The other point of compression um, that's less common for thoracic outlet is behind the pec minor. Um, and this is thought to involve more people with neurogenic TOS um, and not so much venous or arterial TOS. And it is um, at this junction where you can have pec minor muscle um, hypertrophy. It can pinch the nerve as it crosses to go to the arm. So what, um, what is the underlying um, pathophysiology that leads to the development of TOS in patients? Um, I think it's well known that if you have repetitive trauma, it's well described in some of the baseball pitchers or um, football um, quarterbacks. Um, you have hypertrophy of the muscles um, from um, sort of um, working out. And uh, repetitive trauma can cause inflammation and uh, spasm and stenosis around the um, the ligaments. Um, sometimes you can have congenital variation and anomalies, and it could be quite variable. Some people are born with just um, hypertrophy muscles, and uh, we talk about the cervical rib as being a, a congenital anomaly. So TOS is rare. It um, affects about 2% of the general population. The age range is typically between 25 and 40. Women are affected more so than men for the neurogenic TOS whereas the uh, vascular TOS, um, the ratio is almost one to one. Symptoms distribution, it kind of depends whether patients have neurogenic venous or arterial. 
Um, 90% of all TOS is really neurogenic um, in nature, but um, the uh, Venus and Eritreal um, TOS are the ones that we're more interested in, although um, if you're interested in TOS, you can certainly branch in to do a lot of the neurogenic TOS as well as a vascular surgeon. So the clinical history, these patients tend to have very vague symptoms when it's involved neurogenic um, sort of uh, structures, and uh, they may have pain um, of the head and neck or arm. It's really very vague. Um, venous TOS or arterial TOS, um, of course, have different symptomatology with uh, venous compression or venous thrombosis that you can find on exam. And uh, arterial uh, TOS can lead to aneurysmal formation um, or embolization with uh, arm ischemia. Uh, the TOS is us usually very, um, a neurogenic TOS is a diagnosis of exclusion. You sort of um, look for other sort of areas of pinch nerve and um, kind of come down with the finding that there is no real other um, compression um, syndrome other than um, the uh, thoracic outlet. Now, what are the exacerbating symptoms? Elevation of the arms or hands, uh, reaching over, head, lifting, prolonged typing we talk about, speaking on the phone, shaving, brushing hair can make uh, symptoms worse. This is a slide showing how um, uh, the pathophysiology for venous TOS with a patient that can form collaterals over time from chronic compression and fibrosis around the blood vessel, or they can present acutely with acute venous thrombosis. Arterial TOS is um, a rare, most rare form of TOS. It can cause a digital or hand ischemia from uh, um, embolization more likely than chronic occlusion, because uh, chronic occlusion usually actually um, they have very good collaterals in the upper extremities. Um, but they can have uh, claudication with chronic occlusion. Physical exam. So typically on physical exam, you don't find anything for neurogenic for most patients with TOS, right? Um, exam, you would find something if the patient comes in with venous arterial um, TOS, and uh, that would be you know, swelling of the arm if they have acute venous thrombosis, um, hand ischemia if they have um, some evidence of... Um, embolization or, um, or chronic occlusion of the artery that may lead to um, decreased pulse in the, uh, at the wrist. Um, now for neurogenic exam, um, you can try and tap on the uh, anterior scaling muscle, the pec minor muscle, to try and find trigger points, and that may support the diagnosis of neurogenic um, TOS. But the bottom line is really, um, the, uh, the diagnosis is, of, is that of exclusion. Now, people talk about these provocative tests, and I think this is something you must know for your exam, but I don't think these are very specific. Um, they happen to be positive in a lot of normal patients, but it's always good to have it done to support your diagnosis if you think the patient has TOS. So we talk about the ASIN maneuver with uh, first rib elevated, um, this sort of when the patient turns towards the ipsilateral side and uh, on deep inspiration, they apparently lose their radial pulse. The right test is with the arm abducted or hyperabducted with deep inspiration again, you pull the thoracic outlet up and that uh, decreases space and you ablate the radial pulse. Again, this can happen in normal people with no sort of symptoms of TOS. And then the other test people talk about is the Roos test or the East test or elevated arm stress test. And that, as you can see the figure here where the man or here the man sort of puts his arms up and rapid and opening and closing of the fists for about 30 or 60 seconds. And then you lose the pulse in the, um, in the radial artery. And so you can do these maneuvers on exam or you can actually also do these maneuvers on ultrasound and try and demonstrate decrease in the distal flow. So we always do all these tests as well, um, even though most of patients will actually have negative um, nerve conduction study, negative EMG when they have neurogenic TOS. The bottom line is you do these tests to make sure they don't have other compartment uh, syndromes such as the median nerve compression or the ulnar nerve compression or the medial cubital nerve compression. Duplex ultrasound, um, it's always helpful to kind of support the diagnosis. Um, if you can do those provocative tests and show that there's reduced flow we mentioned about. Radiograph, it's important to look at the cervical rib 
And then other diagnostic studies, CTA, MRA, MRV, um, to show the um, sort of pinch of the thoracic outlet on the um, provocative testing. This is a non-invasive study showing reduce in the um, distal flow with, um, in a patient with occlusive disease. Here you can see subclavian artery compression in this uh, slide here, whereas with the arm dependent, there's normal flow, and then with the arm in a stress position, you can show colorful disturbances. This is an example of a thoracic outlet arterial uh, component showing the aneurysmal dilatation of the subclavian artery. This is an intraoperative image. Here is a um, MR angiography showing the pinch in the uh, subclavian artery. Um, here with the, the arm elevated, you can see it down here. You do the same thing on angiogram here with the arm um, by the side, there's no real pinch, and then you elevate the arm up, you see a bit of a pinch. Again, this can happen in normal people. Positional angiography, um, again showing arm adductic with the pinch here of the subclavian artery. Same thing for the MRV, you can show MRV pinch right there. This is a, thank you. This is a quick example of a VTOS um, uh, patient. She was actually a medical student who um, presented with acute venous TOS. Um, and you can see the, um, the uh, occlusion of the subclavian vein there. And here we cross the, sub, the occlusion with um, the catheter and we um, perform catheter directed thrombolysis. And this is the, um, angi the venogram after we lyse her, and we balloon it, and then we, uh, we're happy with the result. But of course, you know, the, the one thing you must remember is that, although we're not going to talk about management, is that once you've recanalized the vein or, or the artery, then you must remove the offending agent and remove the first rib so that they, to prevent recurrence. So we took out the first rib, and this is a repeat venogram in that patient um, six months later. So TOS, um, physical therapy, the first line of treatment, and then surgical decompression, if that doesn't work. Um, not going to talk about treatment too much. And this is what happens to the uh, stent if you don't remove the first rib after you've recanalized the vein. So always remember to uh, remove the first rib before you stent these patients, of course. So in summary, um, anatomy is important when you're dealing with TOS. Um, remember the relationship between bone, muscle, and the neurovascular bundle. There's three classification, neurogenic, most common type, 95% of the time. Venus is second most common, arterial the least common. Um, the diagnosis is really a clinical diagnosis, and all the uh, imaging testing is really just support, to support your diagnosis. Thank you very much.